Well, uh, let me ask a very silly question. Uh, when you see a pregnant woman, uh, like, for example, uh, Eugenia, who is looking at us electronically, you can ask, what kind of species do you expect that the baby will be? <laughs> of course, everybody will say she will have a human baby. Of course she will have a human baby because she and the father of the baby gave to the baby half of their DNA, half of their genome. So in the next 18 minutes, I'll talk to you about this genome and its relationship with human development and human disorders. And I will have a conversation with four women that I would like to introduce to you. And each one of them I call her a founder woman. The first one is adenine. So adenine asks, what is the genome? The genome is a very long but finite molecule that gives us a lot of information and a lot of instruction of our biological lives, of our development, and of all of our characteristics. And it's also a very important determinant of human health. So here is a portion of my genome, about 10,000 letters or 10,000 nucleotides. The genome is a long text written by four letters, A, C, G, and T. And it is three, 300 times longer than this for a total of three billion letters. And each one of us has three billion letters genome from his father and three billion letters genome from his mother. So each one of us has two copies of a complete genome. The question of the second lady is, what is individuality? The second lady named Guanin. Well, every time we make a new human and every time we make a new cell, we copy the entire genome. And the copying of the entire genome is a fantastically important mechanism. And uh, it's very faithful, but the copying of the genome sometimes makes small mistakes to the order of one letter mistake for every 100 million letters. But that is enough to create a tremendous variability in the genomes that we see today on Earth. So here's the same piece of my genome, the 10,000 letters, but with small blue flags, I noticed the differences in one copy of my DNA from the so-called reference genome that we have in our databases. So one in a thousand letters or nucleotides vary in two randomly selected genomes from the population. So the DNA that I received from my father and the DNA that I received from my mother, if I compare them, they differ in about three million letters. And the difference is not only this, there are other kinds of differences that I will not talk to you about. But the bottom line is that all of us we are very similar, 99.1% identical because we belong to the same species of Homo sapiens sapiens. But each one of us has this peculiarity in its or her genome. And 0.9% differs between the two genomes of the two different individuals. And that makes the fantastic variability that we have as human species with the different characteristics, the different kinds of intelligence, the different cultures, the different uh, modes of arts, the different achievements. And we need this difference and the variability because the difference and the variability provides us the possibility to evolve and to adapt all the time to the ever-changing environment. But as you know, in life, there's no free lunch. We pay a price for this. And the price that we pay for this variability is that the genomic disorders or the genetic disorders that we have um, is, as I said, the price to pay for the potential of the evolution and adaptation in the changing environment. And as this uh, very famous population geneticists said, nothing 
in medicine and other fields makes sense, except in the light of evolution. The DNA variants, or the variability in our genome, comes in three different flavors. There's a rare variability that we call pathogenic in the lower right part of your screen. They are very rare, but they cause very severe genetic disorders. There's the other variability that I call predisposing, which is common, and it predisposes us positively or negatively to the myriad of disorders of adult age. And there's another kind of variability that I call neutral, which is there in our genome, but does not predispose to anything uh, given the present environment. Now, you all know what is genetic predisposition, but let me give you a geneticist impression of what is genetic predisposition. And I'll take this example from the banking industry. Let's say at the year 2002, I put 1,000 euros in the bank, and the banker looks at me, and I do not speak his language correctly. I have an accent, and uh, he does not like me that much because in my DNA, I, I have this red C that you see in your screen. And because of this, he gives me a 5% interest rate. And then Elena, who is at the audience, who is local and speaks the language locally, and uh, everybody likes her, she goes to the same bank, and because she has an A, in that position in the genome, the banker gives her an interest rate of 5.5%. And after several years, in 2016, I have that much money that you see with a red curve, and she has that much money that you see with a blue curve. Now, let me introduce you the importance of the environment. Let's say that the, the uh, laws of the country at that time, they say that whoever has more money than this green line it will continue to live, and whoever has less money than this green line, it will disappear. So I will disappear because I'll develop Alzheimer's disease, I'll develop several cancers, I'll develop type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disorders, schizophrenia, manic depressive illness, etc., etc. <laughs> so now let me clarify for you the importance of the environment and its interaction with our genome. Let's say, for the moment, that the laws of the country are not the ones that you see there, but totally opposite. Whoever has more money than the green line will disappear, and whoever has less money than the green line will continue to live. What did I change? I changed the environment. I did not touch the genome. And yet, the outcome of this exercise is completely different. So let me now answer this third question of cytosine. So cytosine asks, what is genomic medicine? Now, genomic medicine is almost identical to the so-called personalized medicine or precision medicine, is the medicine that is based on the individual genomic variability. And that individual genomic variability, the reading of the genomes of each one of us, informs diagnosis, treatment, monitoring, pharmacogenetics, you name it. Because the majority of the disorders, all of them, they are due to either a change in the genome or a change in the environment or the interaction between the two. So now the health professionals or the geneticist has a new organ or a new system of expertise, a very important system that is invisible but it's tremendously important, the genome. Like the cardiologist has the heart and the neurologist has the nervous system. And yet, in that particular genome, the three billion letters text that we receive from our mom and the three billion letter text that we receive from our dad, we know very little. We know only the function of 1.5% only the part of the genome that encodes for proteins. And you see that in your green sector, in your Kamenberg over there. And yet, with this knowledge of 1.5%, we can make several diagnoses and uh, we can have a yet, uh, even today, an impact in the medical practice. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about the genetic determinism that, that everybody's afraid of. So here's a disorder that's called achondroplasia. This is a disorder of short stature, 
And the cause of this disorder is a mutation, a change in that red G that you see, in this particular gene that's called FGFR3. The determinism for this variant, for this mutation, is absolute. There's no one living on Earth today with that G changed without the so-called phenotype, the signs and symptoms of the achondroplasia. The genetic determinism here is absolute. Here's another genetic determinism that I call strong, but not absolute. Familial breast cancer due to a mutation in that gene that's called BRCA1. You see, if you have a deletion, an elimination of this A and G in the DNA of this individual, that female has a seven or eight times more probability of developing breast cancer in her lifetime. You imagine two letters difference in the six billion letter genome gives you this strong predisposition for familiar breast cancer. Here's another, another kind of genetic determinism that I call weak. I will introduce you to a gene that's called apolipoprotein E, and this gene comes in three different flavors in the population, a blue-blue, a blue-red, and a red-red, according to the chemical composition of that particular gene. And it turns out that individuals with two copies of the red-red flavor, they have a 12 times more risk of developing Alzheimer's disease in their lifetime. Genetic determinism is not 100%, is not 70%, is much less, but nevertheless, even this low genetic determinism is extremely important for medical care of the individual and the medical care of the community. So that brings me to the next truth, and that truth is that there's no normal human genome in anyone. Each one of us has mistakes, has mutations in, in his or her genome that are very severe, but people are not sick because they have one copy of the bad gene, and they also have one copy from the other parent that saves the development of the disorder. So here is a list of the 20 deadly mutations that I have in my genome in one copy, and I have them in my genome, but I'm not sick with all these very serious disorders because I have the other copy of the gene that uh, uh, gives me the normality. Is that important for me to know? Of course it is very important because since I am a, a carrier of these 20 mutations, if I like to make the genetic experiment with, with um, a female in order to produce a child, and that female happens to have the same bad genes or some of these bad genes, there's a possibility of one in four, 25% of having an affected child. So the knowledge gives us the power to change our lifestyles and change our future decisions. And for the risks, now the genetic risks for the common complex disorders of adult age were not there yet, we're not very good into this, but uh, with today's knowledge, my, my risk for Alzheimer's disease at my age, given my genome and given of what we know in the genome, I have a 4.9% probability of developing Alzheimer's disease, and the average in the population of my age is 7.2 out of 100. Are these numbers different? Well, for some people are, and for others are not. It all depends on the perception of risks and the numbers in each uh, individual. So that brings me to the next question. Is that important to know our genome? Well, in Delphi, there's an inscription, Gnosis Afton, which uh, at the time meant know thyself, and in my mind, it means know your genome in order to plan your life. And for this, we have developed in Geneva what we call the Genome Clinic, which is a clinic in which we see individuals with severe genetic disorders for the moment in order to make diagnosis and uh, uh, potential therapies and potential inclusion in clinical trials. The Genome Clinic deals now with uh, genomic diagnostics of Mendelian and complex disorders, 
to identify also uh, somatic mutations in cancers and to provide the genetic counseling to people at risk. And then tomorrow we hope to provide individualized genome risks according to the evolution of the knowledge. Now I come to the last question of uh, thymine, and thymine asks, what is the genomics future? The genomics future is here, but also there are many unknowns. I told you that we only know 1%, 1.5% 1 of the function of the genome, and the total medical genome when we reach all the knowledge will be about half of it, because perhaps half of it is functional and half of it is not functional. We're not there yet. And there are two tremendously big challenges. Challenge number one is to identify which variation is pathogenic, which variation causes disorders from the millions of, of letters that vary in each individual genome. And the next question is, why the penetrance? In our lingo, penetrance means that some people have a bad gene, but they don't develop the disorder. And others have the bad gene and they do develop. And to understand the mechanism and how that is, it is one of the most important research questions in genetics today. So here's a typical family of Mr. Hazard and Madame Roulette. And Madame Roulette is pregnant on the fourth child. And you see that because of the family history and the age of the family, the fetus is at risk for six disorders, trisomy, Huntington, breast cancer, Alzheimer's disease, fragile X, and cystic fibrosis. And you may think that this is a very rare family, but I argue that with the whole knowledge that we accumulate in the next five to 10 years, every individual will be in this category at risk for several genetic disorders. And then a futuristic note, the doctor goes to the patient and says, do you have a copy of her DNA sequence? so I can make a good diagnosis. And then after the diagnosis, the lady goes to the pharmacist and says, here's my genome sequence. Please give me the right medicine for me. And also, to make a comparison, a final comparison with the financial world, the knowledge of the genome changes every day. And therefore, we need to monitor the knowledge for our genome, our personal genome, as the financial people, they go to Wall Street Journal every day and they, and they estimate uh, how much they're worth. The genome that we have in all of our cells, we need to know what is good and what is bad about it with the knowledge that accumulates every day. So the geneticist, you could see him or her as a health advisor to protect the health capital, our genome, to minimize the effect of unfavorable genes and to maximize the effects of favorable genes. And we, believe me, we are still in the beginning. And as Shakespeare said with the, the mouth of Antonio in Tempest, what is past is a prologue. Thank you very much for the invitation and your interest in genetics. <laughs>